Good evening. Uh, today, as most of you are aware, we joined here by Professor Thor, and um, who is going to tell us about determinism all the way. Um, as most of you know, Professor Thor is a physicist and lecturer at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. His work also focuses on gauge field theories, black holes, uh, and fundamentals of quantum mechanics. And uh, he has done a lot of work in this area, uh, including a proof of the normalizability of the angular non-abelian gauge field theories. Um, and he, as I'm sure most of you know, he won the Nobel Prize for uh, the theory of electric interaction. So uh, I'm not going to store any longer. Uh, that's Thank you very much for inviting me up to me. And uh, I'm delighted to see such a lot of other people come from our lecture. I actually expected a smaller group of people who are more uh, specialized in public. I'll try to use as few limitations as I can and see if you see the paper and go in stand. This will try to uh, fill in data and then the paper can disappear. So, Yes, on the text and uh, this is something all I'm interested in. So, I can have the phone to play so. Now, uh, so most mechanics is the science of small particles, such as atoms, molecules, elementary particles, and so on. And uh, then it is putting all this in a different language, at least that is your first impression. That um, quantum mechanics adds to particles properties which are all familiar to us, like mass. Like, where are they? How fast are they moving? It? How fast are they spinning? All these particles also mean something in quantum mechanics. So it should be really straightforward to work out. What the overall properties are of time objects. And um, uh, it turned out that the equations, which first were like Newton's equations and Maxwell's equations, they change in a drastic and plastic way into something totally new. All this happened nearly 100 years ago. And um, uh, the, the result of the series, second and third, Nobody wants to follow a theory that kind of improve it somewhat. So this work is not about improving something. Mm -hmm. But I would explain that quantum mechanics requires a very special language to be used. So ordinary vectors, two components or three components, or even four or six, they talk of vectors all kinds that you may familiar with the philosophy of sound. Oh, sorry, what's the air in, in, in the room? It's typically three dimensional. Can move forward, negative sideways, or up and down. So you have the three components that are this kind of air. In quantum mechanics, we also use vectors, but much, much bigger ones. In fact, a vector with as many components as there are five millimeters or more. This is so difficult to to touch it, to understand what the community steps are about factors and how can we help possibly be important to this guy who's going to spend the time. As it turned out, that um, this was no way to describe these kind of steps. In 1925, so almost 100 years ago, Kevin Schroeder had a conclusion that tells you how the vector evolves. So it is time to get a final of the huge vector. Maybe I'll put it in the sense of one way is that it holds it to go down, you know, one way is small, you know, it's just big and both further in time, you know, so evolve these patients back up in time. And then you get that to get this back in the day, the has to move and do things. And what you find when you do the propagations is that the theory of distance actually be in a marvelous way, much better than anyone would expect before that. So, the advent of quantum mechanics was a great scientific revolution. 
um, but all the time, except for one thing. The good understand very well what they have in their means. What does it stand for? Does it mean that everybody will, if they're not on the back of our universe, to explain the value of how to move? Is it going to be unlikely? And I say, yes, it's very unlikely, very unlike the law of the as a knowledge of the world. So, what is it that is going on? Now, this is amazing that you have a discussion from the scientists, as you can imagine. But the difference between Niels Bohr was the father of the atom as we see it today. Niels Bohr was the first to understand that the atom possesses the spaniels in the other part of the world, going around with the electrons, and he understood those forces more or less. And then he realized that the ordinary natural and representation would in fact work to explain the properties of atoms, which probably as does. So, um, but uh, that has been more, and then discussion with Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was more, well, I would say I have decided more with Einstein now than before, but Einstein was to apply fundamental logic. I say I don't want to have particles carrying uh, such a big vectors on the that's it doesn't mean the thing. A particle is just a particle. It moves from here to there, and that's it. If you try to understand how it is, it will be a formula. The brand new boy and the other said the shark, which I'm not. They find the lady of the law of physics. But they said, I'm going to do this smart work, I'm going to do that smart work. There's also the division of markets here that people put us in here. What exactly is strangely we have so well what actually says about the reality? And I'll use the word reality and now that in this lecture was a very important concept. Now, what is the really going on if the electric particle behaved by the taking of its vector? It knows it being vector what it does at the same time. So yes, the question between these people. Uh, yes, an answer to that I'm not saying in the article of the law of Einstein is the most important or also the most important example of the equation E because I've seen scale. That was such a relativity. The whole part of the thing is a general relativity, which could be used to understand the application of what is not better than before that. So those two guys are going to be interested about these things. And what they then Finally, well, they didn't try to reach an agreement, but what they finally did to be able to block was a very pragmatic point. The pragmatic point of view is that they say, take this vector, use its equations, the equations tell you how the vector evolves in time. The our mathematics today is far too long in many cases to solve those equations, which from the accessible accuracy. And then you'll see that the equations work. And now, of course, you want to ask what does it really matter? Is this patient not? Where are these patients that you Don't ask the question, shut up and calculate. That was the, the advice that we gave. And that's called the Copenhagen School because the most of the things are many things that happen with the in Copenhagen, where that is the total place in that together more often than also. Anyway, this is a Copenhagen School and Copenhagen. Written, don't ask for the links, just you do the calculation according to the rules and the textbook and works. And we discovered what here it works not only in proximity, it works extremely well. So well that, that today it becomes uninteresting to study that because we know the theory works and we know it can be calculated and the many that's not very to be and uh, it works. But still, this feeling of many people that there's something not right about this situation. So, not all agree completely. Not only Einstein tried to punch holes in the common trend, saying this theory is that something missing in this theory. It's not right. Then we have discussion about the scholars involved in and in the body, and these three act and discussions. And then there's also some things that look like a lot of time, and I can show paper on the subject. And 
Uh, you see now if you look at the title of the, of the paper, it was a Russian author. The author should be the archivist. But anyway, Einstein uh, asked me what have his how great ideas to be published. And uh, so I saw it was not in the paper, but there was some very important message. And that message came out from back to there. And that message is that that you would take a single photo. If you have a single photo, you can measure where it is. That is how see what is good is here. It's a great point. But you can't be both in the same time. So, in the academic world, the same thing is happening from the day. You are either measuring this or measuring that, but you cannot measure these things at the same time. Because then the first measurement changes the particle, but really, the second measurement is no longer valid. So, it is a normal situation. And uh, Einstein was aware of that, and even Paul was aware of that, because it was the way it is. Oh, sorry, Einstein said, I don't believe that's the way it is. So, if one problem, yes, but you can take the two problems, and quantum mechanics tells you you can make these two problems totally untangled. And tangled means that they have the same philosophy, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, momentum, and they have the same. Uh, Position. So, all these two problems, you can together you can do the same one. You can make the position from one problem. You can make the momentum from another problem. And then you say these two problems are equal, like in a laser. You are in all four days. So, to a certain degree, you can make the problems, you can make both of these properties. But now it's wrong because if you have these, these problems, um, if you measure the moment of one problem and position well, and this is to both problems are both equal, then for both problems, you know, both measure, both momentum and position. Something is wrong here, ask the shot. And then it was a no, but we understand how the calculations and the funding of it works. So, but people are still worried about asking how to do it. So, so obviously, the first thing that can be done is to establish a position of one and one of the other, and then both both atoms are completely different. And the problem was, you could say that very well. You just what you said. If you disturb one uh, one atom by one measure, you really disturb the atom. So the second measure is very important. Then. I said that's not something important. Yes, we can do both of these kind of far away. Now they are, they are musical, they are miles away from each other, and you can have the moment of one in the position of the other. And even if they are miles away, it depends on the order in what comes out. And uh, uh, it looks like you have all the problems in the problem, but you don't. There's something wrong. And um, it turned out, in the way it turned out, you can't. Even if you have to measure these two properties, but you still have to accept the fact that one measurement doesn't take us the problems from the other measurement. So there was a problem there, and it was so solved and uh, not solved. There was no disagreement about what was happening if you had to do this, do this kind of measurement. And both Einstein and Bill immediately did the news. Of the outcome of the measurement we do. So there's no basic problem. I mean, it's very hard to set a measure where you can see that something is wrong. So we can tie it very hard. And then in 1960, for much later, John Bell, who is the partner of the physicist, and you know who he is, that John Bell said, well, you're doing the proposition and momentum of the problem, because you're also doing it for the spinning. What does thought and spinning mean? Well, maybe many of you may have heard of problems and spin, but many of you know that something about problems is like if you're doing a 3D movie, if you put um, a 3D movie, if you have these, these glasses with the different glasses, and then uh, on the screen you get corrected, this is seen in two polarizations. One uh, glass of the, of the uh, one lens of the glasses. So I get one signal and the other and the other signal. So we get to send two different signals to the eyes. Both people want to do it. 
So, as a model of visualization, I hope that I will judgment at will. Now, this is very important. They have free will to rotate the detectors any way they like. But now, now, now the observation, uh, Bob's of observation of Falcon going through the detector depends on what Alice will see, and it depends on the relative angle of the, of the two detectors. But these two photons have already been emitted. So the photons have some polarization or other that tells the photon to go through the Bob's detector, but not through Alice's detector or otherwise. So the question now is whether you can compute the correlations between these photons. The answer is yes, you can compute it, but something very crazy comes out. But what the polarizations of these two photons do is impossible to understand if they are classical objects. So I will go back for a moment here. If this photon were a, a particle which carries some polarization, this will have the opposite polarization. It doesn't matter in which direction, but it's always opposite. And uh, then the correlations of Bob and Alice fine depends on what, what these photons were at alpha and beta. But if any one of the two rotates a filter, then the photons at alpha and beta here should already be different. It is also possible because the photons could not know how Alice and Bob are rotating their devices. So there is some problem that Bell could not resolve. So he said, if quantum mechanics is exactly right and predicts as we think it does, then you cannot explain that in terms of predetermined properties of these photons at all. So I would have loved to put the equations on here, but it wouldn't help most of you to understand how it happens. Usually I listen to a talk like this, people give the full equations, but then I can't follow also what exactly the equations mean and what their implications are. But I'm just using words to say the, the to explain the implications of what Bell found, that quantum mechanics is a prediction that these, photon, these two photons could not have been obeyed, could not have obeyed, when after they were already emitted by the atom. Yet it is so, because the experiment has actually been done now. The nice thing about Bell's experiment is you can actually do it, and it has been done now numbers of times, and as everybody expected, quantum mechanics is just head on right. But these photons, there's problems with their reality. What are these photons doing, and how can they arrange to, to behave such that the quantum mechanical correlations are obeyed? Um, it should be easy to understand. The experiment can actually be done. Uh, and the entangled photons have their spins always completely parallel. Uh, this is already what I've explained, most of it. So standard quantum theory, as I, as I said already, has these properties that the prediction is impossible. Now, Einstein claimed, and I think now that he was perfectly right, but although he didn't know how to do it, that nevertheless there's something real about this whole situation. The photons, as Alex and Bob are looking at real photons, so there's something about them that they're intellectual devices. If you put your own written, you detect may say click, or others not say click. That if Alice, for instance, would rotate her detection device only by a small angle, then what would the detector, how does the detector change? The answer is if you want to change the detector by small angle, you can do it two ways. You can, you can just imagine that Alice shifted her detector a little bit and then ask what would the outcome of that experiment have been if she did, but she didn't because we have the previous measurement. Now, there is a problem with that, that in reality, of course, you, you cannot 
look at the same photon. You have to be looking at a different photon. So the resolution of the problem will come in the sense that if Alice will repeat the experiment, she'll have to use a different, different photon than before because the previous photon has already been handled by the experiment. You can't have the same photon go twice through a detector. Um, then people say, yes, that is perhaps right. But we thought that Alice could choose her polarization at will. At will means that long after the photos have been emitted by the, by the atom, Alice and Bob can both at free will rotate their, their devices. How can it be that you're still using these two photons which have been emitted and the photons know what Alice did at free will when she rotated the device this way or that way and the same for Bob. So we run into problems with understanding quantum mechanics. So I think uh, I expect many of you are not really familiar with this complicated physics equations. So I will not go into further details on this about the experiment. And uh, all we want to say is that the outcome of an experiment must be ontological. Ontos is the Greek word for, for uh, truth. The, the detectors only say, say the right thing. The detector says, absolutely with certainty, my photon went through the detector, or it did not, but nothing in between. And um, uh, on the other hand, you want those photons to be real. Whereas this is not the case if you would follow the standard argument that you, the quantum mechanics tells you, if Alice rotates the detector a little bit, then a photon which was sure to go through the detector now is now no longer sure anymore because the detector is rotating. It, it could be a small chance it's rotating, it is polarized in a different direction and it will not go through. You can say that this, all this depends on, on how Bob chose his detector, but Alice and Bob are far away from each other. So they cannot do that calculation that quickly. Even more problematic is that the, the speed of light is not big enough to reach Bob and Alice before they made that decision. It took a while for the photon to arrive at them. And uh, before that, the photons should already have, been, have decided what to happen. There's something basically wrong in this. And what people then point at is this no, these two words at will. They have free will to choose the detector the last moment and that should not affect the photon. Now, my claim is that that's actually a weak spot in the whole argument that there's a real problem with quantum mechanics because why should the photon not depend on how Bob and Alice choose that detector? Right now, but I'll, I'll repeat it in, in the end of the lecture again. I'll say that um, uh, yeah, I have my own, my own reflection, so it's a bit hard to talk. The, 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 the problem is that, that the single photon that was sure to go through the detector when, when Alice did this is now no longer sure. That means that photon is no longer an ontological thing. But in a theory that is fully deterministic, everything that you talk about should be ontological. All the only photons you are allowed to talk about are photons which are sure to do this or sure to do that, nothing in between. So then they are, they are not they don't exist in, in the super deterministic theory. That's going to be my bottom line, but I'm not there yet. Um, yes, this is this could argue that there is no real contradiction because both Alice and Bob can only measure one photon at a time. But only if Bob and Alice change their mind and if this could not affect the photons that are already on the way, then we have a problem, then we have a contradiction. So many physicists say, okay, this means that quantum mechanics is non-local. If the, what the photon does here has, has an effect on Alice there, and if no signal of light could go fast enough from that original photon back to Alice, then there's something non-local about the theory. That's what you'll hear most. And uh, again, uh, recent Nobel Prizes on the subject are from people who make the statement that way. Um, but is it true that you can, Imagine even different measurements in date on a single photon. Well, according to standard quantum mechanics, you're not allowed to do that. But if you want a, a deterministic theory, then you have no choice. Then the photon must have some property that determines how it behaves. So this continuity argument 
and the, the second century, second second half of the century went uh, started, and people started to discuss Bell's experiments, and they actually attached very accurate equations to it to see that an, an observer, an, an experimental physicist, could do this measurement, could have two observers measuring the spin of the photon by letting it go through a detector and check whether quantum mechanics gives the right answer. And by checking this, they found that indeed the quantum mechanical answer was right. So there's, there's a problem that there's something we don't understand. Now, my story may become a little bit more, more difficult, but I'll try to explain in what way you should argue to answer this problem, to answer this question, what, what are we doing wrong? Because I think I know what we're doing wrong. And I published that several times, but I got very little, little reaction because people are too much uh, involved with the standard way of thinking is my belief. Anyway, let's turn the question upside down. I like turning the questions upside down because you might learn something that may be useful anyway in the end. Let's try to ask how to make a completely classical model and what that more classical model could say about quantum mechanics. So the most classical model you can think of is a sequence of points that um, take the value that a circle and the rule of evolution of the system is that, st that state number one goes to state number two. These are states of the universe. So the universe evolves and becomes different all the time. It never repeats itself. So universe is, is in state one, then a moment later, universe is in state two, another moment later, it's in state three, and so on. If you have only a finite number of different states, say in a very small subunit of the universe, the state can only be finite, then uh, it must mean that sooner or later, these th things here that you see will run back into themselves. So this is a model, which is totally deterministic, meaning this goes to that. Yes, not, not only approximately, but really, and they all go around. After 11 steps, this thing is back to its past. 11 is just a choice, my choice of a number. You can have any number of, of, of of circles, billions of them if you want, but sooner or later you run back into where you were before. That means that you can write down an equation for the vector that's spanned by these things. Now, if you have 11 particles like here, or 11 states, your quantum vector is 11 dimensional. So if you don't like highly dimensional physics, you're in trouble here because quantum mechanics likes to, likes to work with infinite amount of dimensions. So this vector just rotates, but if you know that, that, then you know something about the rotation operator. This is an operation on a vector n. It goes to n plus t, but t is the number of steps you've made. So u of t is what we call an op uh, evolution operator. Not so easy to grasp if you haven't heard of this before, but mathematically, it's quite straightforward to do that. And then you can investigate this operator u. And this operator u, it turns out you can diagonalize it. How do you do that? Well, you can find states, which are what we call the discrete Fourier transformation. That says that you take these 11 states, and now you, you ask for that state where they all, uh, where the vector are all equal. Or you can ask that the vector rotates in a very special way. Uh, you find that in certain components of the vector run faster than other components. And if you look at them together, you find that there are again 11 different vectors. Each are just rotating around the axis. So these vectors are not changing direction, they're only rotating around their own axis. So nothing much happens in the system if you're in one of those vectors. These are called eigenstates. And the reason why this is so important is that this evolution operator has everything to do with energy. So the evolution operator tells you that energetic objects will rotate faster than objects with low energy. And this system turns out to have n energy states that you can also call ontological, except in terms of the energy states, nothing happens anymore. These, these energies, these vectors just rotate like that, and that's all there is to it. If you have that, if you have n states, and if these states represent energy, then it means that this system can have energy in only 11 different, different forms. And then you calculate this. Now comes the calculation, and I won't do it for you because it comes from this formula. The calculation is that all these levels are equally spaced. So this is a, the spectrum of 
things that an atom could emit, for instance, atom, atom could emit photons with energies arranged by the, the spectral lines of the photons, then all these spectral lines would be equally spaced in this case. So that is the outcome of, of a calculation. And the nice thing about this is that the calculation looks very much like the calculation you get out of a harmonic oscillator. But before discussing that, one, that's the one thing I want to say, first of all, look at the real universe. The real universe will not contain only circular uh, situations that run back to themselves, but have, will have many different circles. So there are things that oscillate very fast. They sit in a small circle. There are things that oscillate very slowly. They sit in a large circle. It takes, a lot, it takes some more time to run back to yourself. So the most generic model that describes any universe, including I think quantum ones, has this shape. There are small circles and large circles. Wherever, whenever you are in a circle, you hop at, at, this, at the beat of a clock, you hop to the next circle until you reach the point where you started off from. And then the system closes. So you see such a universe closes into separate units that don't seem to talk to each other. At first sight, it seems that you haven't changed very much. Um, but uh, let me first, uh, before saying that, let me say something about the spectral lines. Those of you who do have some more physics experience will recognize the spectrum here with these equal lines. That's the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. If you're just a thing like a pendulum of a clock, which, which can only do one thing, which is uh, move to and fro with a given, with a very fixed uh, frequency, very fixed. Uh, uh, periodicity, then that's a clock. Now, the pendulum of the clock can go, it can go very fast, it can go very slow, or it can go very wide, or can can make a, a very tiny uh, amplitude. But in all these cases, the clock will run with equal speeds. That's the typicality of the clock. You can understand that using Newton's equations, but you can also understand it in terms of quantum mechanics. In terms of quantum mechanics, the state of the clock would be energy if the clock would be a quantum clock, but all the clocks are quite classical, but that's a side mark. Um, but this looks very much like something that already exists in the universe, which is the harmonic oscillator. And um, we now imagine the universe to be filled with such oscillators. That's not such a strange idea because there could be waves of particles going through, and um, every wave of a particle uh, has not only a wavelength, but also a frequency. So think of sound, when you hear a high pitch note, note that you have high frequencies. Sound with a lower pitch has lower frequencies. And then there can be intensity of sound, of sound as well. Um, so the universe contains lots of such things. And, but unlike the model I just had before, these, these uh, oscillating objects are actually interacting with each other. So, they could, for instance, be two water waves. They could go through each other. And then where the two water waves hit, because the equations for water is not quite linear, so they can interact. And uh, this kind of interactions makes our world look more interesting and more complicated. Actually, you can attach an oscillator to every single elementary particle that uh, sits in the universe. And so every particle is already an harmonic oscillator in a sense. So yes, these things occur a lot in the universe. Let's consider the universe being separated completely. If you manage to do this mathematically, it's not easy, but, but you can think of doing that. Then it turns out that in principle, yes, this universe will still be deterministic. So the whole thing will again be described by equal energy levels. The point there is that some energy levels are so high that you don't recognize them as such. Instead, you have to do your calculations over again and, and attach these particles lower energies. Um, so energy is not actually defined if the positions of these particles are high. So here's the same situation as in John Bell's and, and uh, Isaac Rosa Podolsky uh, paradox. The problem is that if you know where the particle is, you don't know its energy. If you know what its energy is, you don't know its position. The, the energy constant states, all states where the particle is, is always everywhere at the same time. Or more precise, you don't know where the particle is. And um, now comes the 
uh, a new ingredient of argument, which is that the universe is very rich. The universe has very slowly moving things. So dinosaurs and planets are relatively slowly moving, but atoms and elementary particles can move very fast. So they're very fast moving things, and very slow moving things. You have to take the whole lot together and then you can, can think of making a deterministic model. But it so turns out that such models are extremely difficult to solve in a sort of adequate way. So what you do in, instead uh, is to say, well, we have different kinds of, of particles in the universe, ones which oscillate very fast and ones which oscillate very slowly. And now there's some very remarkable effect that the fast moving particles will be in energy modes, just like the slow moving ones. But the energy modes of the fast moving particles are much wider separated. So these energy levels are far apart from each other, sometimes as far as 10 to 19 GeV in the extreme case. So much faster, much further apart than even the particle accelerator can, can reach and, and, and it can study. So these levels are so far apart that you never need to worry that these states will actually be excited. It doesn't happen according to the laws of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics say that low energy objects are much easier to create at low temperature than high energy objects. So in practice, the high energy objects will not be created at all. So these energy levels will simply not re be reached. So to describe this fast variable, you only need the lowest energy level. And this is an element that not many people have yet taken into account for a deterministic model. This is in a purely deterministic model, but in a purely deterministic model, you cannot reach these high energy levels anyway. So let's assume now that we know that this particle is very close to its ground state, and it equals zero. So according to thermodynamics, that is of course true. You don't need to discuss that. But when you are in a company of, of quantum people, then you have to justify that the particle can only be in its, in its zero energy state. But that means that in that case, you're almost integrated out of fast variables. This actually you do often in, in particle theory, uh, when we assume particles do exist, which however are too massive to produce. In this famous standard model, you get nice simplifications if you assume so sort of super unified particles, but the super unified particles are far too heavy to produce in any machine. So only thing we know is what their energies are. So we can assume now such things to happen and now something new happens. Um, and uh, let me just for a moment try to go back. Um, yeah, what happens is that, that if you make it comp that computation and I've skipped the details because otherwise I get too technical. And um, so okay. if I just uh, skip, the, the, the calculations are the only thing I say is you can just as well leave the particle where it is in the energy equals zero. Quite right. According to the deterministic model, the particle can be anywhere. And uh, according to quantum mechanics, yes, but we put it in an equal, e equal zero state. Why? Well, that's the only state where the particle has an equal probability to be anywhere. It's just completely unknown where the particle is. It goes too fast. So we don't have that the time to, to measure where exactly it is. It's because the particle rotates like mad around circles. And when it rotates like mad, it means that they have this state n equals zero. But that state was not compatible with this statement of where the particle is. Again, you have this quantum duality. Either you know the energy or you know the position of the particle, but you can't determine both at the same time. But now, the difference between the previous situations, now we know exactly what we are doing. We are just computing a system with fast and slow variables. Anybody can imagine what it does. Not anybody can imagine how complicated such models can actually be in practice. They can be so complicated that there's no way to do the calculation at all. Even though we're looking at the, at the classical system, which is fundamentally simpler than quantum mechanics, it's still too hard to do the calculation. Well, you can do the calculation, isn't that nice? Well, yes, but the calculation says that now what you now have to do is calculate the corrections because you made a slight mistake. The particle is not, not always sitting in the ego zero state. A very small possibility is there that the particle gets excited. That means the probability of finding a particle somewhere on its circle is no longer always the same. There could be some preference that it sits there, depending on what the classical 
uh, slow variables though. So now the system has become very, very complicated. And the only way to solve that is doing quantum mechanics. But this time, the way of doing these calculations is that we, we accept quantum mechanics as a tool. And this is how I would like to see it, that quantum mechanics actually is just a tool for calculations rather than a new property of the physical world. It was discovered as a new property of the physical world, but that was the discovering the tool before you knew what the tool was for. And now I claim the tool is for doing calculations where you know some particles move so fast that you, it is sense that you try to follow them. Then the price you pay for that is what you now call quantum mechanics. Now, the thing is we can think of doing such a thing for the real universe. We know many of the equations for the real universe. We don't know many different particles. We know there are over 20 fundamental constants in these equations that govern the precise way in which particles behave. And uh, these, many of these things have been measured. So we know a lot about the universe, but to do that right, you have to, um, to do certain calculations that go expansion. So you first assume particles do not interact, then you assume the particles interact with weekly, and you, you calculate the first corrections to your equations due to interactions of particles, then that is not infinitely precise, you do the next correction and so on. That's called the perturbation expansion. A system is perturbed and you, by doing expansion, you calculate term by term how the, the, the correction should be made to, in order to get your calculations to work. And um, so in, in the real world, this model exists. It has about 20 constants, each of which have to be expanded. But now instead of that, we can do we can take a classical model and do the one over n expansions, where n is a number of elements that the fast variable has in its chain. And then if, if something happens only when the particle sits at one spot, then, then our calculation will not be able to, to tell what happens, but the quantum calculation would be able to do it what happens. So the quantum equation will tell you, yes, we can do a one over n expansion. And now our big problem will be, here's the universe, here's my, theories about quantum mechanics. Now get the real universe described by this theory of quantum mechanics. How do we do that? This is still way beyond anybody's ab ability, so we can't. But we can already use some words to say what in principle the problem is that you have to do. The problem is look at the standard model, look at all its expansion parameters, and now look at the quantum model and see that it has as many expansion parameters as the standard model, but now they are one of n expansions. 1 over n, where n is the number of elements on a ring for the fast variables. And now the idea is that perhaps we have talked about the same thing. Perhaps the standard model of elementary particles is the same thing as a similar model that is totally deterministic just by having 1 over n serve as a coupling constant. How much time do I have? So I, uh, I have a few more slides. So. So now, this is a speculation would be fantastic if true speculation that these two expansions have something to do with each other. Many people believe that, yes, the fine structure constant is an expansion parameter in a standard model. It is about 1 over 137. 137 seems to be a magic number for electromagnetism and quantum mechanics. Maybe that number is actually 1 over n, maybe that n is 137. It could be. So, but that would be fantastic. And uh, another no price would be waiting for me if I could do this. I can't do this. It's too difficult. Uh, but you can speculate that somewhere in the future, people will figure out how to do this right and how to make models that match with a deterministic model. So to do this, you have to do either a coupling constant expansion or a one over n expansion. And neither will be very precise. You want to compare these two and say what which n obeys best the equations that we know about in nature, but neither of the expansions will actually converge. And that has been a problem. People say, ah, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't converge, but we're, we're just filling around and we get some good answers anyway, even if the expansion doesn't converge. But actually the expansion doesn't converge for very sound physical reason. No, neither the one of n expansion nor the uh, coupling constant uh, expansion are accurate, accurately defined beyond a certain order. So you have to stop at some point. So um, uh, if 
you do a sequence of calculations after done a calculation about n times the sequence the next correction turns out to be not a correction at all but uh, a, uh, a further departure from what you want to calculate so they don't and no, nor do we care we just want to know that these ex ex different expansion procedures actually match with each other does it settle the issue no uh, there are still people who make big objections and um, because now I'm claiming that quantum mechanics and classical mechanics actually are exactly the same thing physically. So the same physical objects that we're describing, only we use different mathematical techniques to do so. I try to illustrate briefly what those mathematical techniques are, expansion procedures, uh, expanding, uh, expanding operators in the eigenstates and so on. We have all these mathematical uh, techniques we have in our pockets to use, but we still get paradoxes. So where do these come from? Well, my claim is, as I mentioned really before sometimes, you're not allowed to make counterfactual measurements. What does counterfactual mean? Well, Alice is measuring a photon which goes through the filter in this direction, but Alice wants to know what, what would have happened if I rotated my filter in any other direction, no matter how small. And the whole claim is you can't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, Alice would have to work with a different atom. Why is that? Well, that is something that about determinism. Determinism determines that the atom you're looking at goes through your filter or not. But if you calculate with infinite precision, nobody can do that, but if you could, then you would, know, you would be able to calculate exactly whether the atom, would, whether the photon would go through the detector or not, and uh, or through the filter or not. There would never be a maybe. Whereas if Alice thought that if she rotates a little bit, then the photon becomes a superposition of two photons. But that cannot happen in a deterministic theory. And that's, I think, the, an error many people make here, that they think that that, that half-rotated photon is also some deterministic thing in a deterministic theory. But we say, no, it can't be. In a deterministic theory, you only discuss things that exist, not things that exist maybe, not things that... that obey probability distributions. But in order to analyze the situation, we have to work with probabilities. And so the quantum equations are all we have to, in, to investigate nature because there's so many fast moving things that we don't know about that we haven't been able to, to find any better procedure. Quantum mechanics today is the best way to do the calculations, even if you don't know exactly what happens. So what I've stated here is that um, uh, Ontological states, well, the photons are always ontological in the deterministic theory. And they stay ontological also when they go through a detector or not. They know in advance, where, or, or the, the, the mathematician knows in advance, whether that photon goes through the detector. I call that the ontology conservation law. If your initial state contains only objects which are truly in one particular state, not in another particular state, then this is an ontological state. If you say there's a probabilistic distribution, like you usually say in physics, because you can't measure everything. You don't know how the universe got started at all. So of course we have to use work with probabilities. Then it's not an ontological state, then anything can happen. But the most important thing is the extent to which something is ontology, ontological can be defined mathematically. And then we say that property of the object is conserved in time. And this is what I mean that it's determinism all the way. People always build deterministic theories, but you're only partly deterministic, that photon still is in a superposition. No, then it doesn't work, and you run into your problems. But if you assume the world to be completely deterministic, you are, uh, you are in for, for, for a good theory. The theory will be as accurate as quantum mechanics, or better, except that the calculation you want to do, if you don't want to do quantum calculations, you have far too many variables to keep track of. That would be impossible. So we are stuck to quantum mechanics anyway, but this time we understand the theory that lies behind this. And that's what I meant with determinism all the way. That is the only way it will work. And that ends my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really interesting. Uh, 
we we're now going to open up to questions and by now we've been experimenting with the chat box which i hope is working um should be working now um so i'm just going to throw this to the audience and then they can ask the questions okay yes uh, so any questions there's a time um if the time of motion is to free um uh, in that moment what is the energy in the interrupt you say if the time if the time evolution is what discrete discrete yes what is energy in the interrupt well that was in the in the equations so you can still define energy if it is discrete that is actually the green equation in this uh, um, uh, in, in this uh, transparency that says that the states are expanded into different bases of states. So you know, if you have a vector, you can choose a basis like this or like this or like that. Anyway, we, you can then use that basis to describe a vector into, and this is a way of defining a basis. Uh, but the basis works just fine if everything that goes discrete. But then you, you are deriving an operator u, but u is, is not, it should be the exponent of, uh, of this sort. So you would actually, in, in this new basis, use again these exponential expressions, which I don't have on the, in detail here. But um, if you do that, you find that you can still find the logarithm of u, even though these, these points are separated at some distance. You can do the same calculation and find all these states of energies. There is a slight uh, ambiguity here, which is which energy is the lowest, which is la largest. Actually, this has a periodic sequence of energies, but energy is always treated whereas in practice as being not periodic, but just linear. And uh, there's again a simplification that works very well in quantum mechanics because the energy level beyond this is just identical to the energy level here. So um, having that is fine for the equations. So there's no, it's right for you to ask the question, is it true that you can define energy? The answer is yes. Thank you. Yeah, for the question. All right, thank you for the talk. And uh, the argument about Alice and Bob is giving uh, according to your material, um, that Alice and Bob have the free will to revert the uh, polarization filter. Yes. Um, and you're arguing, arguing in favor of the feminism. Do you then believe that the free will does not exist? And how does that affect your worldview or your worldview in life? Well, it's exactly as you say that strictly speaking, the world is controlled by deterministic laws. So everything is completely determined, including long in advance whether Alice or Bob will rotate their detector in whatever direction. So Free will is a totally illusionary concept, according to this theory. Although you know very well in practice, you do have free will. And the reason is that the number of particles in your head are so gigantically big that nobody can ever even come close to doing an exact calculation as to what your decision will be. Even yourself might not be able to do that. And uh, uh, so there is no contradiction in practice. But if you to be very strict would say, well, what happens in your head is determined, not only what happens in your head, what happens with all the molecules in the atoms in the universe at all times is already fixed by the equations. So you also don't have to worry about signals going faster than light. No, it was already determined before the signals had to be sent. Thank you. I have some difficulty in, in understanding you. Could you speak for a little slower? Very high. 
I, I, I still didn't quite catch, 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 catch the question. No. Are we talking about energy or the... Can you hear me properly like this? Yes, maybe. Okay, that's so awesome. Maybe we'll try like this. So concerning the particle with a very high energy first excited state, do you think that there's any chance we'll be able to see them in the early universe when everything was a fair bit warmer and hence perhaps somehow the second round? Oh, you have a very important point. In fact, cosmology, the science of the universe, comes in at some point. So we have to ask, is the universe finite? Did the universe start at a single point or not? Can you calculate not only how the universe evolves, but also how it got started? And you know, Stephen Hawking had ideas about that, but again, that was a clearly quantum mechanical answer and not a deterministic answer. So quite to the contrary, we didn't really believe in determinism. He was at the far other end of the spectrum, so to speak. But um, uh, but it is very important to know, in principle, how the universe got started. And uh, yes, in the very beginning, the universe was extremely hot, and all these energetic states were also excited. In fact, that means that even these fast variables had well-defined positions in the very, very early universe, and everything was so hot. But very soon, their position became un controllable and uh, uh, nobody was there anyway to, to see what these, what they were doing. So in very soon we'll have to make approximations and those approximations are what we call quantum mechanics today. Lovely, thank you. Uh, we'll have one more section and then anybody else can come down later with talking. Uh, yeah, and then anybody else can just come down after this, this one. Um, so, uh, you hold this thing a bit further away because I, I don't want oh, to suit the previous one better. Okay. Exactly. Um, I'm saying that although we do not know the equations, so it doesn't mean very much in practice. You do not know the equations. You also do not know how the universe got started. Was there really only one dot or one particle? Some people find that's the only thing to believe, that the universe can only have started, have started at the utmost simplistic way. Otherwise, what else could have determined its initial state? But we don't know this. And uh, we also don't know the equations that tell us how the universe evolves. So. In practice, of course, it doesn't really matter. And in practice, it, the distance between pure quantum mechanics and the deterministic version, which I'm trying to defend here, is not as great in practice as you might think. But the deterministic version is more logically understandable and might possibly give us new information about particles as I explained. The one of N could be one of 137 or something like that. Uh, thank you so much. Oh. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening and thank you so much for giving me the talk. Uh, it was really interesting and um, yeah, that's it. There, there's snacks and drinks outside if you'd like. <laughs>